I hope that by the end of this video, you've become an absolute master with some very important breathing techniques. We all know that one person who's always stressed about everything. Could be a friend, could be a coworker, could be you, could be somebody that presents in the clinic. Oftentimes they're type A personalities, neurotic at times, right? A different population here would be those with obstructive lung diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. In this population, the people have increased airway resistance and this makes it difficult to exhale. They don't have any problems inhaling. It's actually the exhalation that's a problem. And actually, both of these populations tend to respond very well to pursed lip breathing. Other than for stress and anxiety, the biggest indication for pursed lip breathing is to reduce dyspnea, which is another term for shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is something that we see in people suffering from acute stress or anxiety, and also COPD. Pursed lip breathing also helps increase the degree of gas exchange at the alveoli, particularly of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And in individuals with obstructive lung diseases like COPD, it helps improve air exchange by creating a positive pressure that helps keep the airways more open during exhalation, which is where people with COPD have the most issues. In terms of stress and anxiety, it also helps promote relaxation by altering sympathetic parameters in the following ways. Decreasing heart rate, decreasing respiratory rate, increasing tidal volume, and decreasing blood pressure, particularly the systolic blood pressure. As you can see right here, the patient position is going to be either standing or seated. I would say seated is preferable because it promotes more relaxation. And if they're going to be seated, they should have some back support. Purslet breathing is performed by slowly and fully inhaling through the nose. And then the patient exhales slowly and fully through pursed lips, as if to flicker a birthday candle. Now in general, there are no set parameters for how long each of these should occur, inhalation and exhalation. However, they do need to be slow and full, and in general, the exhalation should last at least four seconds. For people with COPD that already have issues exhaling, it may take longer than four seconds, sometimes upwards of six seconds, to fully get the air out. And while performing this technique, the patient should focus on minimizing the use of abdominal muscles during exhalation. People with COPD already overuse the abdominals, for example, the rectus abdominis, to force the air out while they're exhaling. This should be minimized. Now, society and social media say that having a belly with any degree of non-flatness is bad. If you're having your picture taken, suck in your gut. If it can be done fast, do it fast, and if it can't be done fast, don't do it. What if I told you that every single one of these things is trash for your breathing mechanics? So it's time to unlearn what you have learned about breathing. Now the lungs can be divided up into three arbitrary sections. The upper third is the upper lungs, the middle third is the middle lungs, and the lower third are the lower lungs. And these, by the way, are not referring to the lobes. These are just arbitrary sections. Now, beneath the lungs is the thoracic diaphragm. This is the major muscle of inspiration. It doesn't matter if we're doing quiet or active inspiration. We're always using the thoracic diaphragm to some extent. However, we can bias the use of different sections of the lungs. For example, we can use more of the upper lungs or we can use more of the lower lungs. If we're using more of the upper lungs, we're relying more on inspiratory accessory muscles, most of which are located in the upper thorax. Examples would be the scalenes. Remember that the anterior and middle scalenes elevate the first rib. Posterior scalene elevates the second rib. Also the sternocleidomastoid by virtue that it attaches on the maneuverium of the sternum, so it can help to pull the sternum upward. 
and also the pectoralis minor, which attaches on ribs three through five, and can help to elevate those to some extent. So those all help with active inspiration. Now, when you do all the stuff that I showed you on the previous slide, in addition to taking more rapid, shallower breaths, you tend to rely a lot more on the upper lungs, and therefore you rely more on these inspiratory accessory muscles. Now the upper trapezius does not play a role in inspiration, but the reason I throw it in there is that individuals who tend to rely more on the upper lungs, so those who take more rapid, shallow breaths, tend to have tightness in the upper trapezius, and also tightness in these other muscles right here. And when you rely more on the upper lungs, you're relying less on the lower lungs. Now on the flip side, if we perform a type of breathing that relies more on the lower lungs, then we minimize the use of these inspiratory accessory muscles, which is good. That also tends to, over time, make sure that these muscles are not as tight. When we heavily rely on the diaphragm for breathing, we also activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is that rest and digest part of the autonomic nervous system that allows the heart rate to decrease and also the blood pressure to decrease. It overall gives us a sense of relaxation. That parasympathetic nervous system is not going to be near as active if we're more relying on breathing through the upper lungs. We have to rely more on the diaphragm to get that parasympathetic effect and to rely more on the lower lungs. The other reason this is clinically relevant is because as you go down through the lungs, you tend to get better oxygenation and in general gas exchange. So that includes getting rid of carbon dioxide as well. So the more that you breathe using the lower lungs, meaning reliance on the diaphragm, the better oxygenation you're getting, and also the more removal of carbon dioxide that you're getting with exhalation. So overall, you can see that using the lower lungs and therefore the diaphragm is very important. So how do we do that? Well, we do what's called diaphragmatic breathing. So diaphragmatic or belly breathing, as it's often called, is really good for promoting relaxation because it alters those sympathetic parameters that we already talked about, very similar to pursed lip breathing. Decreased heart rate, decreased respiratory rate, increased tidal volume, and decreased systolic blood pressure. It's also good for increasing cardiorespiratory fitness and increasing inspiratory muscle length and strength. It's also good for increasing the gas exchange at the alveoli. Remember that the lower lungs have much better gas exchange, so better oxygenation, and also getting rid of wastes like carbon dioxide during exhalation. As you can see right here, the patient position is either going to be in standing or seated. Seating is preferred, and if they're going to be seated, they should have some back support so they can focus on the diaphragmatic breathing. To perform this technique, the patient's going to slowly and fully inhale through their nose, focusing on expanding the lower rib cage. Then, the patient's going to exhale slowly and fully through pursed lips, as we talked about before, as if to flicker a birthday candle. Now during this technique, the patient should focus on minimizing the use of those upper trunk muscles, those ones that we talked about that help with active inspiration, upper trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, the scalenes, pectoralis minor. We're trying to minimize the use of those because those facilitate breathing through the upper lungs. We want to facilitate breathing through the lower lungs and expanding the lower rib cage. So the patient can feel whether or not they're expanding the lower rib cage during inhalation by placing one hand on their belly. When they inhale, it should push the abdomen out, which they'll feel through their hand. And then exhalation should then allow recoil of the abdomen back to its starting position. Additionally, you can have them put their other hand on their upper thorax, so around the sternum, so they can feel that they're not overutilizing that part of the lungs. Note that the upper parts of the lungs are going to be used. We just want to minimize their use in favor of the lower lungs. 
diaphragmatic breathing can also be done in the hook lying position as you see right here with head support. Again, slowly and fully inhale through the nose, focusing on expanding that lower rib cage, and then exhaling slowly and fully through pursed lips. You can see right here that I'm using my right hand to ensure that I'm pressing the belly out. And I'm using my left hand to make sure that I'm not over utilizing the upper thorax. One cue you can give the patient is to make sure that when they inhale, give themselves a Santa belly or make it look like they're pregnant at the end of inhalation. The last breathing technique we're going to go over here goes by many names. Sometimes it's called box breathing, square breathing, military breathing, 444 breathing. And it's very similar to purse split breathing, except we have periods where we're holding our breath and there's specific times that we're following. So box breathing is really good for promoting relaxation by altering sympathetic parameters decreasing heart rate, decreasing respiratory rate, increasing tidal volume, and decreasing systolic blood pressure. And it's really good for promoting anti-anxiety. It helps the person clear their mind, relax their body, and improve focus. The patient's going to either be standing or seated. And the general idea, and why it's called box breathing, is you're going in this pattern here around a box. So, breathe in for four seconds. So step one, patient inhales through the nose for four seconds, attempting to approach the end of inspiratory reserve volume. Then, going down this side of the box, patient's gonna hold this lung volume for four seconds. So basically just holding their breath at the end of inhalation. Then, they're gonna breathe out for four seconds. So step three, patient exhales through pursed lips for four seconds, attempting to approach the end of expiratory reserve volume. And then last, the patient's gonna hold that lung volume for four seconds. So you basically have four things, each held for four seconds. And that goes in a cycle around this box over and over again as long as you want it to. So here in the video, Inhale for four seconds. I get to the top and I hold it for four seconds. And then I, through pursed lips, exhale for four seconds. And then at the end, hold my breath another four seconds. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.